Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here. Top question for the day is, why did my libido crash all of a sudden? Here's a scenario. Say your relationship is strong and things are going really well. All of a sudden, your sex drive is just non-existent. This can happen to both men and women. And the question I get all the time is, why? You know, why did this happen if I'm happy in my relationship and still find my partner attractive? I want to tell you exactly what I tell my patients when this comes up. First thing they know is, you're not crazy. You know, this, this drop in your libido is because of hormonal changes most commonly. The big ones are going to be the androgens, the male-like hormones. Now, both men and women make these. And we're thinking about testosterone primarily, also DHEA. Then we're also thinking about the estrogens. And this is also a factor for both genders. And in general, the androgens are a problem if there's too little. Sometimes way too much can be a culprit, though, especially for women that have PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Estrogen is trickier. Men, it can be a culprit when there's too much. Sometimes men are on medications to block estrogen. In those cases, it can be a problem from too little. Otherwise, too little is not common for men. Women, it can be either. You, know, you can get too much or too little. You can also get the wrong types. So there's different types of estrogen, some that are better than others. And we'll give more depth on that. Cortisol can also be a culprit. And that's any way that your delicate rhythm can be thrown off. If you've got, you're stressed, you're wired or tired, you're crashed, any way that it's not thriving can be a big culprit for that. Well, your blood sugar can also be a factor. That can also strongly affect your libido. The good news is there's things you can do about that. You know, first and foremost, get your hormone levels tested. You know, get some good blood tests done. Now, blood tests are better for the androgens, the estrogens, the blood sugar. Salivary tests are nicer for the cortisol. That's the one distinction because we want to know not just how much you're making, but when you're making it. And that's where salivary tests really shine. They allow that to show up. So once you get some tests done and get some clarity, there are times to where your hormones can need some fine-tuning. And this can be an in-depth discussion about hormone correction, hormone replacement. Oftentimes, there are some supplements that contain common and simple ingredients that can make a big difference. And of these, one of my favorites is calcium deglucurate. Here's why it's helpful. Your hormones are made by your glands. You know, this is the ovaries, the testicles, the adrenals. They circulate throughout your body. Your liver packages them, sends them to your intestinal tract, and they should leave. But things can go wrong at any point. You know, how much you make, how well you package, how good you get rid of them. They're all places where errors can occur. Calcium deglucurate is useful because it benefits your liver. It changes how your liver is packaging the hormones. Your liver works by taking things like hormones and first off, breaking them up, you know, making them into separate, more reactive parts. We call that phase one oxidation. The next step is you package them. You take those reactive parts and you put them together in a way to where they're going to leave your body and not undergo reactions on the way out. We call that conjugation. One of the main ways your liver gets rid of hormones is by glucuronidase conjugation meaning that you use compounds like glucuronidase to conjugate and package them, get rid of them. I almost think about like Velcro. If you want to have Velcro not stick to everything, you could put cotton over it, and that's what conjugation is doing. So calcium deglucurate is like your body's own glucuronic acid and helps you conjugate and better regulate your elimination of hormone byproducts. Another compound that's useful is chrysin. And this is neat stuff because it's a plant bioflavonoid, you know, no drawbacks, very, very safe. It acts on an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. And what it does is helps your body control how much estrogen you convert. So along with getting rid of hormones, you're also recirculating and converting them. And the androgens, some of them get converted into estrogens. Sometimes that's happening too much. That's especially a problem for men, and especially men that have more fat tissue or men who are on topical hormone replacement. They can form higher amounts of estrogen, and chrysin can be a safe way to reduce that. Sometimes it's also useful for women that have 
estrogen dominance. They're making a lot of estrogen, but they have far too little progesterone and far too little testosterone. So that can be a great way to help keep more of it going where it should and less forming into the extra estrogen. Another ingredient in supplements is methane or DIM. This is a compound that's derived from cruciferous vegetables, things like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and it's useful because it acts mostly in the bowel flora, and it helps your body make the right byproducts out of your hormones. I mentioned how you make them, you circulate them, you package them, you try to poop them out, but along the way they can convert. So methane keeps them safer, and it's some of the, the byproducts like estrone and some of the subtypes of estrone that are not only harmful, but they can goof up your libido. They can change the, the physical nature of that. So these compounds can make a big difference on your body's hormonal management. Here's a topic to think about too is that hormones are important. Do consider the, the stress load. You know, do consider all the ways in which stress can affect you that are not just the hormone change, but by affecting your level of interest. You know, our bodies have different things that we're really pre-programmed to do. I've heard these called the the four F's. <laughs> so there's uh, feeding, uh, fleeing, fighting, and then reproducing. <laughs> and these are all pretty innate survival responses. But however, they they take they take a toll on us, and the most costly, so to speak, the one that takes the most physical investment, is reproducing. And that's true for both genders, but it's more true for women, meaning that to have a baby is a big liability. And if you're insecure about where you're getting food from, or if there's physical dangers, thinking like to some survival situation, your body's not going to try to have a baby in those circumstances because that would jeopardize your own health. So when there is a higher load of stress, that by itself can change your interest towards reproducing in ways that are very subtle and very subconscious. So consider that as well. Anything you can do to create more white space in your life. You know, I've had really good friends that have just have everything's going for them. They're doing all the right things. They've got wonderful things happening in their personal life, their business. And so commonly they'll say that they don't have a libido and they just have no interest that way. And in some cases I've talked to them and worked with them and seen that, wow, they're pretty dialed in hormonally, but their schedule's just so full. And I've seen this happen a lot to where I've encouraged them just to create a lot of free time, just to take scheduled, unscheduled time, as funny as that sounds, take some big blocks in the day and big blocks in the week in which you don't have commitments. And sometimes that alone can be a powerful aphrodisiac. (laughs) You know, a baby is a pretty big project. And a lot of things that happen with our body and our mind are very subconscious. And if you feel that your schedule is so tight you couldn't take on a big project, you may not have the interest in it. (laughs) So free space, free time. One thing I'd like to think about too is uh, Dr. Stephen Covey had written the great book about the seven habits. There was a phrase in there, a little discussion that was so powerful to me, was that love is really a verb. You know, people think that love is a state that we find ourselves in, or that like falls upon us from Cupid's arrow. But he argued that no, it's an active, it's not a state that you happen to be in. It's a verb, it's a process. So to be in love, you have to love as a verb. You have to actively express that in ways. And if you find yourself not as attracted or not as much in love in an emotional sense, then the trick is not to hope it changes or seek a different relationship. The trick is to express love as a verb, and you'll find the emotions switch and change. So thinking about just your life and your happiness, just know that your physical intimacy is a critical part of that. Enjoy these steps and hope to see your spark back in no time for you. 